Hello, hello, hello. How's it going? We've got some production value for this stream. Hope this all works properly. How's the mic volume for everyone? I see uh, Purple Wave out there. I see Antigua. Awesome. So first of all, just for everyone um, in the stream, this is going to be recorded and put on my YouTube channel for later viewing. So uh, I know this is really late for all the Europeans out there. I think we've got probably a couple of them out there in the chat. But uh, I'm going to put it on my YouTube channel. So for those of you watching this on YouTube, this was recorded live on Twitch. And I don't know why the chat isn't showing up. Oh, man. What's going on? It's supposed to be right here. Oh, that's annoying. All right. Well, we'll go like this then. Um, yeah, the, the stream looks fine. I was supposed to have the chat down in the bottom left, but I guess it broke like right before. Oh, there we go. Oh, I see what's happening. The, the chat is being removed like every 15 seconds. So that's cool. It'll, oh, it actually works. That's awesome. So yeah, this is uh, being recorded live on Twitch and it will be recorded and put on the YouTube channel. So the StarCraft AI competition, it's run every year. This is the AIIDE StarCraft AI competition. And I've been running this now since uh, 2011. So this is actually my 10th year running the competition. And there's some people out there in the chat who've, who've been around for almost that long as well. So today I'm going to go over the official results. So I've got the presentation that I'm going to give at AIIDE. Um, I'm going to give the presentation that might take, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes or something like that. And then I'm going to load up some of the replays. And I've got uh, Mr. Dan Gant, Purple Wave Jaden himself, who's going to help me commentate some of those because I've been out of the StarCraft AI scene for a while. So I'm, I'm not really sure what's happening with a lot of the bots, but he's going to be able to, to help me do that. And hopefully there'll be no really serious technical issues. Um, but yeah, if you are a bot author, could you wave your hand there in the chat just to let people know how many bot authors we actually have out there in, in Twitch land? Oh, I just say saw McRave show up. How's it going? So we've got a, we've got at least a couple out there. Later bot. Technically I still am, but haven't worked on any bot this year. Yeah, you you've been around you've been around a while. I'm skipping my favorite streamer to watch you, but you're already watching me, right? Okay. So, let me see if this is going to work properly. I'm going to get straight into the presentation, and if I see any important questions while in the presentation, I'll stop for a second and answer them. Hi, I'm from Europe, a bot author. That's awesome. I'm glad that uh, some Europeans were able to stay up. And just as another uh, thing, so the aid conference starts tomorrow. Um, the competition finished last night. We've got 150 rounds played. So because there weren't as many bots this year, we played the most rounds ever in any competition. So pretty statistically significant results. That finished up last night. I finished the presentation today. We're going to go over the presentation. And then we're going to watch some replays from the competition itself. So let's bring this up here and see if this is going to work. Hey, look at that. It works. Perfect. Okay. So... Welcome to the stream. People still showing up there. I've got the uh, the chat turned off for the presentation, so sorry about that. Yeah, so this is the the report and results from the 2020 AID StarCraft AI competition. Um, I'm David Churchill. I'm a professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland, and I've been running the competition since 2011. So this is actually my 10th year running the competition. It was run, The first year was run by Ben Weber out of UC Santa Cruz, and then he graduated so he kind of passed it off to uh, whoever would take it, and that was me at the time at the University of Alberta, along with Michael Burrow, another professor at the uh, University of Alberta. And also we have uh, Richard Kelly. I'm not sure if Rick is out there in the chat, but if you are, say hello, because uh, Rick has really been doing a lot of the technical work on the uh, competition for the past few years. 
Yeah, based Rick for sure. Rick has been an absolute lifesaver. I would not have been able to do any of this in the last two years with him just because I've been so busy. So these names should probably be reversed, at least for this year's competition. And we are based at the Memorial University of Newfoundland. So where the hell is that, you might ask? It is right here. Oh, this is reversed. Right here. Okay. So this is a map of North America. We are located in literally the most eastern city in North America. If you go down, the only thing that's actually south of us is like Puerto Rico and a bit of Brazil. So it's quite far east. Um, we are actually in the eastern time zone plus 90 minutes. So it's 10 p.m. here. Um, I can show you that I'm not lying. It's 10 p.m. in Newfoundland right now. I know it's a lot later for, for some of the Euro people though. But if you're interested in where Memorial University is, um, because you're like looking for a university, it's a pretty good one. So of course, uh, none of this is would be possible without the people who, who wrote BW API and maintain it. So Adam Heinerman has been the main name for that over the years. I know that a new version of, of WAPI 5 is in the works and a lot of people have been working on that. So thank you for all your hard work. Who knows when or if that will ever be released, but we, we hope it will be soon and that it'll be able to, to use the remastered version of StarCraft that everyone is having fun playing. As I mentioned before, um, last year when I gave this presentation and I was too lazy to update the slides, it was the 10th year of the competition. Uh, I don't know of any AI competitions that have been running this long. Does anyone know? Does anyone else have any idea? Maybe there's like the Rock, Paper, Scissors competition or something like that. Any others been running this long? So this is the 11th year. So I used my, um, my MS Paint skills to put that in there. Oh, Ladabot says the guy who created Factorio also started BWAPI. That's amazing. I love Factorio. I did not know that at all. That's really cool. So yeah, this is the 11th year of the competition. And if you want to actually uh, see the results, I'm going to um, post them on the website. So right at the end of this presentation, I'm going to rename the secret directory so that it'll be viewable for everyone on the website. So if you go to StarCraftAIcompetition.com, um, or this will be the URL as soon as I enable it at the end of this presentation. But if you're watching this on YouTube, then it's already enabled. So go, go watch that. All right. So the tournament format. So for anyone who's not familiar with the competition, we play the full game of StarCraft Brood War. Um, so what does that mean? The full game, meaning that there's no cheating, there's no map hacks, there's no anything like that in the game. We have Fog of War enabled. And what happens is people write bots in C++, Java, um, other languages that can actually control the Brood War client to read data from the client about where units are and then send commands like attacking, defending, etc. So like I said, this has been going on for 11 years now. And so the, the software has, is quite mature. We play for our competition. There's a round robin format and I'll talk about this, like why we chose that in a second, but we play one versus one games. And so while there are, there's something to be said for like two versus two or free for all stuff like that. But right now the, the current state of StarCraft AI research is really still in the, the one versus one type of games. So when you get into things like two versus two, you start to run in, maybe there's some race imbalances or map imbalances. And so our competition doesn't deal with anything besides the one versus one games. And then what we do is we say that the bots are going to be ranked by their final win percentage. And this is a little controversial. Um, there are other competitions out there, like for example, the uh, Student StarCraft AI competition. They finalize their results with a little, um, like a top 16 uh, bracket type competition. And that's great because it's super uh, exciting. But what we do is we just run as many games as possible and we rank it by the final winning percentage. Some people have suggested to us to do things like ELO calculations or true skill calculations. And the great thing about that is that we actually release um, all the results. So on the website, every bit of data that we collect, every replay, every game, every crash is all on the website. So if you want to go back and actually look at that data and do things like calculate ELO, etc., then by all means, you can do that. Um, but we just don't include it with the official results. So the game rules, we have a 60 minute time limit in our games because what happens is that 
StarCraft AI bots, sometimes they, they don't do so well. And we've had a number of games over the years that are just like one bot sitting in one corner and maybe it can't find like the hidden building of the last of, of the bot that's still alive. And so in StarCraft, you only win the game when you're either your opponent concedes and surrenders or when you kill their last building. And so in StarCraft, there's actually a built in game score. And that game score is a function of things like how many resources you've collected, how many units you've killed, how many buildings you've built, all that kind of stuff. So what we do is after 60 minutes, we shut the game down and then we use the in-game score as the tiebreaker. And I don't know if anyone out there in, in Twitch land has uh, ever seen a game that was won with a, higher, with a lower score, but they're, they're quite rare. And so we might have one or two or three a competition where... Um, someone is being outplayed the entire game and their score is, is being dominated and then somehow like sneak attacks and wins. It would have to take like a really bad mistake for someone to, usually for someone to win the game with a lower score. We don't allow any cheating or in-game glitches. And is it just an automatic disqualify if any cheating was found? And in 11 years of running the competition, we've never found any cheating. So in this case, cheating means like trying to hack the memory of the game to be able to see units you're not supposed to be able to see. Also, um, like trying to, for example, flood the game's memory with something to make it act really strangely. You could also um, read and write a bunch of files to make the computer behave strangely. Then we also could have uh, in-game in -game glitches. So there's a bunch of glitches in the StarCraft game engine. Like for example, when, when a computer is playing, they can click infinitely fast and when you can click that fast and issue actions on a frame perfect basis it turns out that you can do things like make the command center slide up a hill or all sorts of crazy stuff that the game designers weren't really intending for you to do and so if we see anyone doing that we also disqualify but as I said we've never had a bot um, in the competition that tried to do anything like that before and similar this year we haven't seen anything yet also very importantly we penalize bots for slow computations. And so we give bots a loss if it goes over our preset computation limit. So this is a real-time strategy game. It's not a, an anytime strategy game. So in a game like chess, right, you might have a game clock and you can take like a minute per turn. But in real-time strategy game, if you're not taking an action, then your opponent can be killing you. And so we've, impo we've imposed some, uh, some time limits. So for example, if any one frame goes over... 10 seconds or 10 frames over one second or something like that. And also if a certain amount of frames go over 55 milliseconds. So the StarCraft game, it, uh, it runs at 24 frames per second on the fastest speed. And so a thousand divided by 24 is like 42 milliseconds, I believe. And so we give that plus a little bit um, of wiggle room of 13 milliseconds just for lag or whatever. And so we say if 300 frames go over 55 milliseconds, then you lose the game. Also, we have uh, the ability to do online learning during the competition. And so we have file input output that we've enabled. Um, so for example, when your bot is running, it has access to write things to a write directory, and it can also read files from a read directory. So you can get the name of your bot while you're playing against it from BWAPI. API. So I could say, okay, if I'm playing against Purple Wave and he does his usual cheese, right? I could record, well, he attacked me at three minutes and 12 seconds. So maybe you read that on the next time you play and, oh, it's Purple Wave, he rushed me last time. Maybe I'll put up some early defenses. So you can do learning over time in the competition and many people have done that. Uh, but typically what we've seen over the past few years is that what people use the file I.O. for is generally a strategy selection. So, for example, some of the bots have five or six different strategies that they use, and then they learn over time which strategy has been working better against which opponent. And that's not something that you can really do in a human tournament setting because you might only be playing like a best of seven. But there's like hundreds of games per bot matchup in this competition. So there's a little bit of metagaming that goes on because you're actually in a, an AI competition versus a human competition. The question we always get is uh, why not StarCraft 2? And the real reason for this, 
A is because I haven't had time to, to really look into setting up a StarCraft II AI competition. And there are other StarCraft II AI competitions that are currently running. So rather than put everything on me and have me sort of, you know, being the dictator of the StarCraft AI competitions, no, go, go compete in one of the other StarCraft AI competitions. Um, and also because we want to, um, we have a really strict policy of one, running one client per machine. As far as I know, there isn't a really easy structure to set up one machine versus one machine in StarCraft II AI versus AI. Um, that was how it was a year or two ago when I looked at it. It might be different now. People can correct me in the chat um, if they want to. But there is a lot of work being done in StarCraft II AI. So when I first gave this slide, like six or seven years ago, the answer why not StarCraft II was a picture of the end user license agreement of StarCraft II that said, you're not allowed to do this by law or whatever. We'll terminate your Battle.net account if you try and hack the memory or write a bot or whatever. And the reason for that was that all the bot, like all the, all the games were played online and they had this really fancy ladder system and they didn't want it being polluted with bots, etc., etc. So, so yeah, it used to be that we weren't allowed, but now there is a StarCraft II API for um, for people to use. So you can download it. This is a um, an image here of the uh, machine learning environment. So what is it called? Pi SE2. Um, so you can download this. It'll take StarCraft 2. It'll make really cool machine learning uh, features and you can do machine learning within StarCraft 2. So. All right. Oh, now we're getting on to the actual competition. So this year, we had, oh, I, I see some questions here. What are we working on? These are the results from the 2020 Aid StarCraft AI competition. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, do, I'll deal with some questions later. So these were the entries that we had in this year's competition. We had 16 bots either register or returning from the last year. So over here, you can see uh, the bot name in the left-hand side. You can see the author and their affiliation. A lot of people used to enter as part of uh, a university or something like that, but now we have most people are just um, independent entries. You can see the race that they used, the version of BWAPI that they used, what type of bot that they used. So you could write a DLL or a client um, type of bot and also whether or not the bot is from 2020 or it's returning from 2019. So what returning bots mean is that every year in the competition, the whole point of this competition is to advance the state of the art of artificial intelligence for games. So what we do is we want to compare the results of this year's competition to the results of previous year's competition. So what I do is I go back to the previous year's competition and any bot that had a 50% or greater win rate, I take that bot and I carry it forward into the next year's competition. And by doing that, we can really see like how far the AI has come over the years. Now, uh, so for example, last year, Dakin had a greater than 50% win rate, but UL Bartabot did not. But that's my bot. I, have, I haven't updated it since 2015. And what I do is I enter it into the competition every single year, just as we can use it as a benchmark to see how far down it's going, meaning how, how, like, how strong other bots have gotten over the years. You can see here that a few of these bots have, uh, have been crossed out. And those crossed out bots are ones that registered for the competition but didn't actually submit for the competition. So of the 16 that we thought we were gonna have, we actually had 13 enter in the competition. And this is a really international competition. I think we've had bots from 19 countries over the years. So these are just some of the countries um, that we've had over the past few years. And it's, it's really great if you're interested in it, you can just go to starcraftaicompetition.com if someone wouldn't mind typing that link in the chat for me so people could go there and figure out what this is all about. Okay, so the tournament statistics, how, how did it run this year? So this year we played the tournament um, on 10 virtual machines. Usually ha we have between 10 and 14 virtual machines. And we also had available a machine. Um, so Antigua posted the wrong link. Uh, that's the Student StarCraft AI competition. 
Uh, that's also a really good link, and but that's just a different competition. And Purple Wave posted the the real one. That's fine. Um, the real one meaning the one the the link to the competition that we're discussing right now. So we also had a machine available that was a a, a physical machine with a GPU on it, like a, a NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti. But nobody in the competition this year actually wanted to use GPU computation. So for example, if you're doing machine learning and you need to run like a TensorFlow or neural net or a torch model or something like that, we have had people do that in the past, but this year um, we didn't have that. The tournament ran for between 10 and 12 days. I, I can't remember exactly how long it ran. Uh, 11,695 games were played in total. And that works out to 1,800 games per bot. So that's a lot of games per bot. I think that's the most games per bot we've ever played in a competition. And with 13 bots, that means that we had 150 games per bot pairing. And if you see that this number isn't exactly a round number, it's because uh, some games, they don't start for whatever reason. One bot might crash or there might be a slight network issue, something like that. The, bot, the games are played over LAN, so usually the network isn't an issue. Um, but there are usually a couple of dozen games that don't start for whatever reason. And so with 10 maps in the competition... Oh, I forgot to make a slide about the maps. We had five uh, new maps this year, but I forgot. You can just go on the competition website and see which maps that we played. So we played 15 games per bot pairing per map. So 10 maps... Um, 150 games per bot is 15 games per bot per map. So pretty statistically significant results. By the end of the competition, you can really see which bot was beating another bot. Alrighty. So here I, I keep some running statistics over the years for the competition. And um, so this, this slide shows the total number of entries per year for all the major StarCraft 1 AI competitions. Um, CIG is actually COG now, but it's been CIG for longer. So in 2010, you see that uh, there were 17 entries to the first competition. There wasn't a CIG or an SSCAIT in 2010. It was just, just aid in the fall. And then the other competition started in the next year. And it turned out that actually back in... Um, yeah, this is the total number of entrants. I can't remember if I said that or not. I thought I said the number of games. Oh, that's the next slide. Sorry. So here we see that in the fir very first year of the competition, there were 17 bots. Ben Weber ran that competition on two laptops by himself. So in the first year of the competition, they played a double elimination round robin competition. Um, no, double elimination bracket competition. And so Ben actually started up each bot on one of two laptops and played them against each other and manually debugged all of that. And it must have been a nightmare, but thank him for doing that. And then ever since then, we've actually had software that can run um, games for us. And so you'll see in the next slide just how many games we've run. But we really had an uptick in the past couple of years in terms of the number of submissions but then this year, we haven't had so many submissions. And in, in the 2019 uh, Student StarCraft AI competition had, had a few less submissions than normal as well. So I think a trend that we're seeing overall in terms of number of papers that have been published and in competition entries is that um, there's just fewer entries overall in the competition. I'm not sure why that is. If some people want to post some theories in the chat, I'd be happy to read them. Um, but yeah, just, just a little bit less uh, overall interest in the competitions in the past couple of years. If we look at uh, the StarCraft uh, AI competition's total games played, so here we list um, how many games were played in each of the competitions. So again, in the first competition there were 70 games played, and that was because the games were run by hand. And over the years we wrote software, uh, I believe the CIG 2011 competition was also run by hand. But then we created some software that allow us to play games um, automatically. And what we see over years is that the number of games that we can play in, in just a couple of weeks is astronomical. I see some comments here. Uh, Purple Wave says that the reduction in SSCA IT submissions was due to rolling over fewer bots. I see. So what happened in SSCA IT over the past few years is that um, bots from previous year's competitions were entered into the next year's competition. 
but apparently in 2019 they rolled over fewer of those bots. And so it's not necessarily that the competition is getting less entries, it's just that there are fewer bots being actually played in the competition. So that's good that uh, it's not going down by that much. I also see um, 2017, 2018 is when DeepMind hype was all around. Yeah, so uh, Google DeepMind created AlphaStar a couple of years back. And that had a double-edged effect, actually, I think, on StarCraft AI. I think that initially it brought back a bit of the hype for StarCraft AI, but at the same time, I think a lot of people thought that with AlphaStar, StarCraft AI was kind of dead, which isn't true at all. And so I think that they stopped writing their bots. So we'll see how that goes. I have a couple of slides on AlphaStar at the end. Yeah, as DeepMind liked to say that, that StarCraft AI was, was almost solved, but that's not the case at all. I have another graph here, which is on the race distribution. And so in StarCraft, there are four choices of race. Um, well, there's three races, but four choices. So at the beginning of the game, you can choose the Protoss race, Terran, Zerg, or you can also choose random. And if you choose random, what happens is the game engine will actually just assign a race for you. And so we've had one bot since 2015 playing the random race, and that's my bot, you Alberta bot. So I enter this every year in the competition just as sort of a benchmark to see how people play against it. I'm, I'm pretty disappointed that no one else... I know that there are several people out there who have three separate bots that can play three separate races really well. So just, just Voltron them all together and play random. You would think that that random would be the best, right? Because what happens is if you select a race to, to play, when your opponent starts the game, you can see what race the opponent is, if they've selected a race. So for example, if you select Protoss and I, I select Zerg, when my bot starts the game, I can call a function that gives me, okay, they're playing this specific race. But if they're playing random, the race is unknown. And so if you don't know what your opponent is playing, in my opinion, random is what we should be heading towards for AI, right? AI is, is, is so good at, at, at playing, um, sorry. AI doesn't really care about the race that it's playing, and so why not play all three races? I think the real answer for that is that, you know, right now a lot of bots use sort of hard-coded strategies or, or conditional-based strategies, rule-based strategies, and so writing a random bot is just three times the work of <laughs> on the strategy side of things. So I'm just reading a couple of more of the questions that I got. Most bots that play all three races have one stronger than the other two. The advantages of random don't outweigh the skill difference between the races for the same reason that it's been rare in pro play. So that makes sense. So for example, I know that like TSC Mu, uh, one of the bot authors has good bots for all three races, but he may think that one of them is better. And so why not just enter that one? Random is disallowed in some competitions too, or after a certain stage, it's not allowed anymore. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Cool. All right. So uh, not a lot to say about the race distribution. It's getting more even over the years. We used to see a lot of, um, for, for two years here, we had a ton of Protoss and Zerg, but that's sort of evening out now. But again, Protoss has been the pretty dominant race over the years. For me, our bot used to play Protoss originally, and the reason for that was I just zealot rushed everybody. And so you didn't need any gas, you could just you could just make zealots um, and collect minerals and try and win the game really fast. Okay. Here's a confusing slide that I <laughs> that I edited in MS Paint about 20 minutes before I gave this presentation. So this is sort of a, a family tree of bots over the year. If I haven't included your bot. In, in this, I, I sincerely apologize, there wasn't room for, for every bot. But what I wanted to show very selfishly is, is how over the years, um, bots have been used by other people to create new bots. So I, I'm just going to speak for myself. Um, so as, in 2020, we had a team of like eight people working on UAlberta bot. And that bot was really, really terrible. It was so bad, and partly because we had eight people working on it. 
So by 2012, um, I in 2011, I and another person, Sterling Orston from University of Alberta, rewrote the bot um, almost from the ground up. And then 2020, I rewrote most of it again and really documented it well and, and put up tutorials and stuff. And so after that, a lot of people started using that bot as the sort of go-to base bot to, to create their own bots. And a lot of bots haven't. I'm not saying... I wrote all the bots or anything like that, but it's really cool as a programmer. It, so rare is it that someone uses your software and actually continues it forward. And this is like one of the things I'm probably most proud of in my entire academic career is the fact that like in 2012, a bunch of bots started using um, my architecture to make their bot. So for example, uh, Newspot, uh, Terran UAB, Bonjoa, they all came in 2013 and 2014. Then in 2015, a really great bot called Steamhammer came. And Steamhammer was created by Jay Scott. Um, if you don't know, just Google Jay Scott StarCraft. He has a really great StarCraft blog where he talks about um, StarCraft AI stuff. And I'm sure after this comes out, he's going to have a great blog post um, about the StarCraft AI competition and its results. And so Steamhammer created a ton of quality of life improvements on top of UAlbertaBot. Um, and so he used the base systems that I had, but then made really good changes to like strategy selection, um, et cetera. So some people are saying that Steamhammer is in 2016. Yeah, I think I have it in here, but the dot is up here. So apologies for that. Um, and then Steamhammer had like, like a bunch of uh, bots were based on Steamhammer, including, as far as I know, uh, Locutus and Microwave. So Locutus was based on Steamhammer. Am I correct in saying that? I believe I am. And Locutus has done really, really well uh, in the past couple of years competitions. I'll have a couple of slides on that later. Oh yeah, Ayer is covered up by my face. Here you go, Flo. Sorry about that. Yeah, so Ayer was the base for Ice Lab and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I can't have my face, um, my, my face covers up some things, but hopefully you enjoy, you enjoy my face. All right. And then um, we had a new entry into the competition this year, which was Stardust. And Stardust is from the same author as Locutus. And it's probably 95% new code, but there's some things and strategies and techniques borrowed from Locutus. Um, but not like there's, if you go back in, in history and here, for example, in 2018, Samsung's AI team wrote the Cytobot. And Cytobot was based on the 2015 version of UAlbertaBot, I believe. And so when I went into Samsung's code, I saw comments that I had made 10 years ago, which was really cool. Um, but Stardust is not like that. Stardust, you're not going to find any of UAlbertaBot's code in Stardust. It's almost completely rewritten at this point. But I still included it in the family tree just to, you know, make it a little longer. Someone says, yes, Locutus is based on Steamhammer, also using Bwem by Iron's author, Bweb by, or BWEB by McRave's author, and Fast Approximation from Neo-Humans. Yeah, so it's this really cool community of people who have, over the past decade, written a ton of software. It's all being used by everybody. It's, it's really awesome. So Nova um, wrote, or uh, I can't remember if he wrote... BWTA or just maintained BWTA, but like so many software packages have been used over the years for analysis and stuff. And it's, I think this is like of everything we've done in the StarCraft AI community, this is one of, one of the coolest things. So enough about that. Let's get on to some of the results already. So here is the win percentage over time graph for this competition. And as you can see, First place is in first place by a significant margin. In fact, I think that if you go back through the years, um, this is, is the most dominant victory of any bot in any competition. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty safe in saying that, I believe. We also have in second place um, someone who is very far in second place. So there's like, I think 13% between first and second place. And this is win rate over time, of course. And then we have another 10% between second and third and like six or 7% between um, third and fourth. 
Someone asked, what was the final win percentage of one and two? I will show all of those statistics. I'll show more statistics than you want to know. The next graph is the wins per round graph. And so you can see here that there weren't too many dramatic shifts in the number of wins per round. So the wins over time bot um, uh, or graph, sorry, you can't really see how many wins there are per round. But here you can see, you know, the bots that were on the bottom, you know, there's a couple of instances like here at the very end, the, the fourth last or the third last bot uh, did a little bit better, but overall it was it was pretty flat. So no like crazy swings here where any of the bots were doing a lot of learning over time. Sometimes you'll see like one bot gain. So for example here, this bot probably implemented some learning over time to get from about 31% win rate up to about 40% win rate. So we'll look at the end to see who was doing that learning and, uh, and how they were able to do that. Sometimes interesting things happen with StarCraft, especially in AI competitions where strategies are a little bit more hard-coded than in, in human AI competitions. So we can often see these sort of rock, paper, scissors scenarios where like bot A will beat B, B will beat C, and then C will come back and beat A. And so it can happen with different strategies. Like if you're familiar with like the holy trinity of, of uh, 4X or RTS games, rushing beats expanding, expanding beats defending, and defending beats rushing, right? So if I chose uh, to expend my early resources in expanding, well, then I don't have any defenses, so rushing can beat me. Um, if I chose to expand and get more resources and my opponent is defending and not attacking me, then that gives me enough time to build up a bigger army. And so expanding will be defending. And of course, if someone rushes you, typically attacking costs more than defending and you have the home base advantage. And so defending will be to rush. And so RTS games at a very abstract level are kind of like rock, paper, scissors. And, and one really cool example of this was in the 2017 competition where there was actually a 10 cycle between the bots of who was beating each other. And when I say greater than here, it doesn't mean the bot was better. It just means that bot one had a greater than 50% win rate against bot two. Bot two had a greater than 50% win rate against 10, 10 against six, and then we cycled all the way back to one from the top 10 bots. So that was really cool. In 2020, because there was such a dominant performance from the top four bots, there wasn't really um, that same sort of result, but something interesting did happen where the fourth place bot dominated the second and third place bots, but unfortunately the fourth place bot lost heavily to the seventh and ninth place bots. And so if the fourth place bot hadn't lost to the seventh and ninth place bots, then it would probably be in second place, I think, maybe third place. So here is just a sneak preview of the... Um, of the rock, paper, scissors effect. So this is the pairwise bot, um, the pairwise bot wins and losses. And if you have a rock, paper, scissors effect in here, you'll see a lot of red over here and a lot of green over here, but we, we, we haven't seen that this year. All right, so the actual results now, I, I, I for some reason, um, my PowerPoint bugged out on me, so I can't see the next slide anymore. So. Congratulations to McRave with a 57.22% win rate um, in the competition. And McRave is not Protoss. Are they not Protoss? Uh-oh. What race are you? How did I get that wrong? Zerg. Okay, so let's pretend that that's purple. Um, in the actual results, it should be fine. So ignore the slides. I apologize for that. Um, so 2019, this column over here means what, what place they came in 2019. So this is a huge bump up for McRave. So congratulations to McRave for coming in fifth place with almost 60% win rate. Yeah, facing the top left. All right. Ooh, there we go. We're live editing it. In fourth place, we have Dragon. So Dragon was written by TSC Moo, uh, who has competed in many years past um, with a 62.38% win rate. And in 2019, uh, TSC Moo did not have a bot in, the co in our competition, so I, I don't have any results here. But over the past five or six years, 
Um, Vagard, who's the actual uh, the, the actual first name of the author, has done quite well, placing in the top three of many, many of the competitions. So well done to, uh, to Dragon. And as I said before, Dragon actually had a winning percentage against the second and third place bots, but lost against the seventh and ninth place bots. So I'll have a full sheet of the results that you can actually go and look at once I'm done with the presentation. In third place, we have Banana Brain. So congratulations to Banana Brain. I, do, I, I don't have another monitor. I'm using all three of my monitors. So I, who was the author of Banana Brain? Can someone tell me the name of the author so I can read that out, please? Johan de Jong. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. So Johan de Jong, congratulations on third place with almost 70% win rate. And seven, more than 7% ahead of third place, which is excellent. So great job on that. In second place, we have Purple Wave. Purple Wave is another Protoss bot um, with almost 80% win rate in, uh, in this competition and coming in second place. And Purple Wave came second place last year as well. So very, very consistent results there. And now I'm sure that most people who competed in the competition probably know who is first. But congratulations to Stardust. So Bruce Nielsen, congratulations again. Um, so Bruce, with his bot from last year, Locutus, came first place in last year's competition. And this year, absolutely dominated. I don't know how. We're about to figure out how. We, we have his, um, his uh, survey that we're going to read a little bit from. But Bruce did an absolutely phenomenal job this year. Maybe it was the new name. Who knows? You know what? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that this is what happened. But if people had stuff in there that said, like, if bot name equals Locutus, then do this, <laughs> then that no longer worked. But I, I don't think that that's the reason he won. I'm sure it was, like, just overall um, really good, really good things that happened. So now I'm going to go into some more of the details of just the top two bots. But I did send out a survey and the survey has a bunch of questions that um, that each bot author hopefully will answer. And then you'll be able to see, um, you'll be able to read about each of the bots in the competition from that. So I won't spend too much time talking about uh, many of the bots. Yeah, so Antigua in the chat says, Total bot rewrite from the ground up after spending three years optimizing Locutus paid off. Yeah, for sure. That was really, really excellent. So congratulations to Bruce on, on the win this year. Well deserved. Here are the overall results. So this will be available on the website as, as soon as the, the um, as soon as the presentation is over. So we saw again about 1,800 bots per um, or 1,800 games per bot, and we see the wins and the losses and the win percentages in these columns. We also have two columns here. This was the average game time. So average game time means, um, so when we actually run the competition, we run the, the StarCraft engine as fast as it can possibly run. So for example, the game runs at 24 frames per second. But our competition for some of the bots might be running at 100 or even 200 frames per second. And if you want to use all of that 50 milliseconds per frame, you totally can. But if you don't, then the game will just go to the next frame. So we have two timing columns here. The left one is the game time. So we measure the game time in frames and then convert that to actual um, game time if it was played by a human Okay, at the fastest speed. So this is how long the game would have taken if played by a human at the fastest speed. And you can see here, for example, it's really cool that you can see sort of the strategies that they're using just by looking at this. So we have uh, ZZZK bot must be doing a lot of rush strategies, right? Because his bot was the fastest. You Alberta bot I know has a bunch of cheese strategies in it. So nine minutes and 40 seconds. And then we go up here like Dragon um, and Purple Wave are also kind of long. So they're playing medium to long game strategies maybe. But it's still all pretty, pretty short in comparison to human games. Then we have the wall time. And what the wall time here means is how long did the game actually take to play um, on our computer? 
right? So how many minutes did it take to play the actual competition? And so let's see. Yeah, someone in the chat said that Purple Wave is the uh, CO2 winner here. So we've got the most wall time for a Purple Wave. Um, McRave. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll say that in a bit. Uh, we've got ZZZKBot, which is not only the... Uh, so let's let's do some quick back of the napkin stats here. So ZZK bot was like 50% faster than Purple Wave, but used almost one sixth of the computation time. So Purple Wave has some cool stuff going on in there, I assume. Next, we have the game time limit um, column. And what the game time limit is, if the game went to 60 minutes game time, not wall time, but 60 minutes game time, we stop the game and we tie break by score. So this is essentially the number of games that did not come to a StarCraft conclusion. And so here we see that, like, for example, um, I, I do want to say one thing, though, about Eggbot down here. Um, so Eggbot, and I forgot to say this before, uh, had a 5% a win rate, but we need to give them some props because Eggbot was a StarCraft AI bot that was written from scratch by a student in one of my undergrad courses, so did not use UAlbertaBot, wrote it from scratch in less than a month, and then had the had the the braveness to actually submit to the real competition. So congratulations to Eggbot for competing in the first place. All right, you are first place among all the undergrads who submitted bots. Um, so the next column is the crash column. And the crash column, um, and as people are saying, yeah, it's not easy to write a bot from scratch. So that was really excellent work. Uh, and as you can see, their bot only crashed once. Like, crashing once, is that's crazy good, right? Like, even my bot crashed six times. So crashes here, um, it's not necessary for the game to actually crash or, like, seg fault. But, for example, if the game doesn't start for any reason or if the game times out on a frame, like if it goes for like a minute on one frame, then those are considered crashes as well. And so, um, yeah, it's writing StarCraft AI is almost as much of a software engineering problem as it is an AI problem. And so, oh, hey, is that Nathan? I think it's Nathan, right? I don't mean to, to dox you there, but I think your name is in the sheet anyway. So yeah, Nathan is uh, one of the students from my class. Congratulations for actually getting that bot in. Uh, and on the end here, we have uh, frame timeout. So frame timeout is the number of games that you lost because of the computation going too long. So I'm sorry to, <laughs> to Christian McRave and to Johan, but yeah, a lot of games timed out there. So let's see, if, if, if Johan had won all the games that he didn't time out, Okay, maybe he still wouldn't have been in second place, but, you know, the win percentage definitely would have, would have been up. Uh, yeah, so as McRave says, he won the uh, game timeouts column, so congratulations. Uh, I'm really surprised that you, AlbertaBot, did not timeout. We had a couple up here from Stardust. And uh, Purple Wave, Dan, you're out there in the chat. Weren't you super paranoid about frame timeouts? Are you like that kid in class who's always worried that they'll fail and then they get an A+. Plus? Excuse me. Yeah, excellent job by everybody. That was really, really cool. I was timing out 100% of games on the ladder until a week before the competition. Okay, yeah, so we fixed a bug in, in the... Uh, I'm really glad that you brought that up and we were able to fix that. Okay, so I want to talk about the second place bot for a little bit and the first place bot. The second place bot was written by Dan Gant, who is Purple Wave Jaden in the Twitch chat here right now. So uh, you can at Purple Wave Jaden and congratulate him on the on the second place. Uh, Purple Wave has been around for a long time and has, as far as I know, never placed below third place. So the average finish over time times a number of years is awesome. Uh, he hasn't won aid yet, but he's won everything else. <laughs> So someday, Dan, someday you'll win aid, right? Let me put the camera back over here. Um, and he plays Protoss. And this is a wonderful photo of Dan. And we will actually have Dan on the stream a bit later. He is going to help me comment a couple of his matches. And so 
I'm not going to talk about the bot because Dan is going to explain his bot while we do that. Yes, this is Dan. Very handsome Dan. All right. First place, though, we had Stardust. And so the author was Bruce Nielsen. He's a software engineer by trade. And here's some previous results from Bruce. But again, these were from Locutus. And Stardust is a complete rewrite of Locutus. In 2018, he placed fourth in aid. 2019, third place COG, first place in aid. And this year, first place. So Bruce has just been killing it over the years, getting better and better in time at as time goes on. In his uh, frequently asked questions, he said there was two years total development into uh, Stardust in the rewrite and using stuff from Locutus. 20 to 30,000 lines of code overall. That's a huge spread, so it's somewhere in there. And it was inspired by Locutus, but mostly new code. I asked what Locutus does from a strategic standpoint. Or sorry, this is supposed to be Stardust. I apologize. I, I put the wrong thing here. So Stardust has a fixed opening in each matchup with reactions based on what it is scouted. All matchups currently end up at mass-produced Dragoons unless the game finishes before then. And he's asked why Dragoons? Because they're great for Protoss versus Protoss, they have long attack range, and they can kite effectively, and he didn't have any time yet, excuse me, to work on later game units. So his bot is really unique in the sense that, um, Sort of the meta game for past year's bots, for example, you Alberta bot, would would be to have up to ten different strategies that you can choose from. Try and just just try a strategy and see if it if it wins. And then if it wins, you record that in the file I/O and then try that strategy more and more. But Locutus is doing sort of more of like a human type thing, where he's going to start with the same solid build order and just tweak it a little bit based on what he scouts. So that's really cool. Um, some of the AI techniques that, again, this is supposed to be Stardust, uh, that uh, Stardust uses. It uses A star for a couple of different pathfinding things. It uses influence maps for collision, uh, ground threats, air threats, and invisibility detection. It uses Boyd's simulations. If you don't know what Boyd's are, you can Google them. There's lots of papers and, and demos on Boyd's. For most micro situations, he said, there's no machine learning present in the bot, and there's no online learning during games. So that's incredible that he was able to do so well, but included no online learning about any of the opponents. It's just, oh, here's a new person. I'm going to kick their ass. That's basically what, what Bruce said, and it worked. And it also uses BWEM, um, for the map analysis. Okay. Uh, I don't really have many conclusions from this year. <laughs> Maybe Dan can talk to me about some of the conclusions. Uh, overall dip in registration and interest, I think, is one of the conclusions that we can draw. And the top bots are just getting stronger over the years. They're like Stardust is the strongest bot that's been in our competitions for sure. Um, all right. Someone in the chat said, oh, let me let me go here. And there's one more thing, right? This is, I'm showing my age with the Columbo reference here. But one more thing before this is over. Everyone always asks, what about Alpha Star? Alpha Star is so good. It beats pro humans, right? Okay. So Alpha Star, of course, you have to talk about Alpha Star if you talk about anything StarCraft AI related. It was made by Google DeepMind. It has beaten human professionals. As far as I know, it has still not come close to beating like the top 10 in the world. Um, and that's really what we care about when it comes to man versus machine, right? Is have you beaten the world champion? So AlphaGo was able to beat the world champion at, at Go. But have there been any new Alpha Star matches in the past couple of years? I don't even know if DeepMind is still working on it. Does anyone out there in the chat know? I'll say so if, if so. Here's a little, uh, so, so Alpha Star used a bunch of crazy stuff. Go look at the uh, the nature paper from AlphaStar. It uses, of course, deep learning, um, deep neural nets for keeping its policies and values, um, and keeps a like uh, the output of its neural nets is what actions it thinks it should do on each turn, and it trained on massive, massive, massive scale. It had at least eighty thousand. This is what they said in their paper, 80,000 simultaneous instances of StarCraft II running. So that's 80,000 cores, at least. And it had 1,200 tensor processing units. I don't even know how much one of those costs or how much, 
like electricity that's uni using, but it is, and, and their team was 39 people, I think. It was either 29 or 39. And you got to be paying those people at least a couple of hundred thousand a year. And it must have taken at least two years to write this. So I would say that we are into close to, you're over eight figures on the Alpha Star project. At least 10 million, right? It's got to be at least 10 million. Uh, probably seven figures of electricity alone. So consider this. Memorial University, the university that I teach at. There's 22,000 students who go to this university. Its operating budget two years ago was 369 million, okay, Canadian. Google DeepMind in the same year, its losses were twice that. So it's impossible. It's impossible to catch up. You, you can't. Like there's nobody in academia who is going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars of research money on this problem. And so whatever Google was able to do there is a one-off, Google did it, even if they gave you the algorithm, you can't do it. And so when people say, what about AlphaStar? Sure, but like we're, we're considered, we're concerned with game AI. One of the things that I wanna do is create better tools for like making games or for testing games, right? And so if you create some indie RTS game, are you gonna call up Google and like, hey, can you spend $10 million of electricity to, to train my thing for me? Of course not. So what we're trying to do, or what I'm trying to do, is come up with like more real-time um, AI that can perform better and better um, in, in these games. And so when people say, what about AlphaStar? There are other things in the world than just deep learning. Deep learning is incredible, but whatever. But I still think, in my opinion, that Alpha Star was definitely the strongest overall StarCraft AI that has ever been created. Even all of our bots would lose to it if they played StarCraft 2. I still truly believe that. But A, the deep learning cost was astronomical. No one else is going to be able to do that outside of, of DeepMind. And um, the brain power they had, like, 12 of the, the strongest AI researchers in the world. Like, it's just crazy. You're not going to be able to do it. Also, as someone else said before in the chat, I saw, what do you think the carbon footprint is of D DeepMind or of AlphaStar? Um, well, this reporter, Karen Howe, in 2019, found that a single AI model that was trained used as much CO2 as five cars in their lifetime. Right? That's a single model that was trained. And so I can't remember, go look up that article for the details on this, but deep learning has a gigantic carbon footprint. And I know they're trying to cut that down, but it is literally not only polluting the academic world in terms of bad papers, but it's polluting the actual environment as well. All right, so here's my email. If you have any, any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. You can go to starcraftaicompetition.com. That is the presentation. Now, let me go back. Okay. So here we go. If you can bear with me while I set up the replays that we're going to be watching. And I am going to get Mr. Dan Gant on the line. Here we go, Dan. I saved a spot for you. Okay. Saved a spot for you in the, uh, in the hive mind here. So where's Dan? Okay, let's get him on the old um, start voice call. Let's see how this works. Hey, Dan, are you there? Can you hear me? I cannot hear Dan currently. One second. Desktop audio. I'm going to turn that up. We've got to debug this real quick. Can you type in the Discord window if you can hear me, Dan? <laughs> Ghost of Dan. No, he'll be there. We tested this earlier. Your Discord light is not lighting up.
Okay, I cannot hear Dan. Let me pull my speakers out to see if it's a speaker problem. Can you try speaking again? Oh, I heard you then. There you go. Perfect. Can you out there in, in the chat, can you hear Dan? Hi, folks. I think you can. He's he's being picked up. Yes. Awesome. All right. We did it with technology. We did it. That's awesome. Um, sound is low quality. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, not everyone can can have my, my technology. But... Um, Dan's mic doesn't normally sound like that. Dan, can you just go to your Discord settings and make sure that your input is what it normally is? It sounds like it's being picked up by your webcam, maybe, instead of your mic. How's this? Oh, my God. It's perfect. Awesome. Technology upgrade complete. There we go. Yes. All right. I've actually got to turn you down. All right. Just uh, give me a, a quick brown fox. Uh, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Perfect. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. All right. <laughs> so, Dave, man, thank you for running the tournament. Thank you for having me here. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot for joining me, man. And just just to let you know, I'm not biased towards Dan. I also asked Bruce to be on the stream, but he is on um, vacation with his lovely family, and he said that he only has phone internet, and he would have loved to be here, and I would have loved to have him because who wants second place, right? But Dan Dan's still pretty cool. All right, just joking, Dan. Okie doke. So Dan sent me some replays. Let me see if I can, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit just to get Dan's face a little bigger. Um, Dan sent me some replays from his bot. And what I'm going to do is switch over to that replay and I'm going to turn off my cam so you guys can enjoy that. And yeah, so Dan, I'm going to get you to, I'm going to try and pan around the map, but if there's at any point, um, Oh, I need to share my screen with you, don't I? Let me do that first. Replay viewer. There we go. So now Dan can see my stuff in real time. Can you see me here, Dan? Yep. See okay, your perfect. All right. So, but you're not watching Twitch, right? You're watching the Discord thing. Right. Watching perfect. Discord. All right. So here we have a, a match: Purple Wave versus Dragoon. Um, and I'm going to start this. Maybe I should play. What do you think? Two X for the very start. Uh, maybe four X and scale down to two X when the action kicks in. All right, you tell me when the it, action is going to yeah. kick in. But maybe, first, oh, say, go ahead. Maybe maybe even 8x for the early game. All right, actually, let's let's leave it at 4 cuz I want you to tell us a little bit about your bot and what it does while you're collecting minerals here. Sure. So, um, I started developing my bot in 2017. It's written in Scala from scratch. Uh, it's currently using the JBloppy library, uh, developed by uh, some folks who uh, put a lot of work into making Java a very great platform to write StarCraft bots in. Uh, I did fill out the survey this year, but my, my answer is about the same as always. Uh, Purple Wave is built on a bunch of stuff that happens to work. Uh, originally, the, the strategy was some task networks that devolved into behavior trees, which devolved into very fancy if statements. Uh, but ultimately, Purple Wave tries to do pro-style play as best, uh, as best as I can emulate it. Oh, we've uh, got some action here. We've got some action. Yeah, so Purple so. Wave opens the game with... Uh, Early two gate uh, play, trying to get some zealot aggression in. We're playing against Dragon, who's very adept at defending against it. So Dragon, Dragon seems to have made a uh, a bunker here in the mineral line, and got some vultures. So how annoying is it to micro zealots against vultures? Do you just give up, or do you actually try something there? Uh, the decisions kind of vary based on the situation you're in. Like if you can retreat the zealots to units that can actually deal with vultures, then that's that's a good play. But if you're already in their worker line, you might as well just uh, get some attacks and do the damage you can. Um, and just for some people who maybe aren't so familiar with uh, the unit types in StarCraft, so you're making Dragoons here, which I think, if I remember correctly, are very good against vultures because of their armor type. They're 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 so so against vultures because the armor type, but uh, overall their their stats are just kind of stronger than vultures. Vultures are fast and uh, very mobile and have spider minds, but in terms of straight up combat, they're just not as strong as dragoons. Okay, so we see. What are you going for in this game? Are you you seem to be upgrading the dragoon range? I think. Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. So this is this is a, an aggressive uh, play, opening with uh, two gateways into four gateways of worth of dragoons, uh, trying to get some early pressure in. This is actually theoretically supposed to be a, a proxy two gate where those gateways are in the middle of the map, but uh, due to a bug, they're in my base. Uh, <laughs> That's always how it then, happens, right? Yeah, exactly. I, ac accidentally, intentionally working. Uh, then it's just expanding and then continuing into normal Protoss gameplay. 
So can you explain a little bit of what's happening right here? Because this is pretty standard PVT, right? Where you have Dragoons trying to harass the opening bunker, and then you have these SCVs that are trying to repair the bunker. Because it, if the Dragoons, without the range upgrade, um, they can't kill the SCVs without taking damage. I think I'm right there, right? Yeah, this is a pr pretty uh, common opening sequence. Uh, Terran gets one factory, tries to take an expansion, has a bunker which can be repaired by the, the SCVs, uh, but... Before the tanks get siege mode, the Dragoons are able to fire the bunker with, with impunity because they just barely outrange it. Uh, you can try to pick off the SCVs while taking some damage. It's kind of a delicate dance. Once the siege tanks come out and they're able to get their long range, long range siege mode, that, kind of, that sequence pretty much ends. And here instead we see Purple Wave trying to set up a contain outside the Terran's base. So you're, um, I'm going to look at your army here now. So your army consists of a very diverse set of units, 14 Dragoons. Um, <laughs> which I can't get out of the production tab here for some reason. My arrow keys have been captured by this thing. Do you know how I actually escape from that? Uh, you could, if you press if you press one, it'll go to the production tab. If you press one again, it'll turn off. Okay, perfect. There, there we go. Yeah. Um, but I still can't seem to tap. That's okay. I'll use this to scroll around. So you've got this standard sort of mid-game dance here now, where yep. you're trying to uh, break in, but these siege tanks are holding you back. So what sort of logic do you use in your bot to know when to make that sort of final push? Sure. So uh, it's very common for bots to use an approach called combat simulation, where they take a hypothetical situation where all the units butt heads, and with a simplified model of the game mechanics of how combat works, uh, they basically simulate what would happen, look at the simulated outcome, and decide whether or not they like that fight. If they like the fight, they'll send the units in to go fight. Oh, here come the DTs. You've got D Dark Templar. Sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to show it to save people. So yeah, no problem. Keep going with the combat simulation. So yeah, if you like the if you like the results of this, if you like the simulated output, you uh, have your units go in and fight. If you don't, you have them back up, and then you have separate logic for the way your units will uh, engage or disengage. And it's it's a it's. It's a pretty good method for understanding what's likely to happen in a typical fight, but doesn't really consider other hypotheticals. That's one area that bots are strong at is in those heads of fights could really uh, get down to the nitty gritty of which units are likely to die and, and what's likely to happen, but can't consider hypothetical scenarios like what would happen if half your units went in, what happened, for example, if your zealots went in and your dragoons didn't, things like that. Okay, so dragoon or dragon, sorry, just... Uh decided to push out a little bit and caught a couple of your units. It looked like about an even trade, but um, I'm not sure if you know much about what Dragon is doing here. Are they trying to push out, do you think, to get another expansion? Uh, my guess is that it's kind of some generalized. I'm at a point where I'm, I feel comfortable pushing out and thus just kind of stepwise bringing the units out. Uh, so Dragon is based on Cherry Pie, and my guess is that part of what it tries to do is when it doesn't exactly want to take a fight, when perhaps the army wants to be on the map, but in the moment to moment doesn't think it's going to win a fight, uh, we'll do a flood fill around the enemy army, come up with a, or, uh, a kind of a line or a certain distance away from the army and try to position units across that line. So that's what, how I think uh, Dragon is winding up with the arc of siege tanks that are about equidistant from the Protoss army. So uh, talk about, I think you're in the late game here now. I know we're, we've kind of fast forwarded through a few things or mid to late game and you've got this Arbiter here. So the Arbiter is a Protoss unit that cloaks units around it. But um, it looks like Dragon is actually using its commsat to scan your units there. Yeah, it's kind of expected that Terran's going to be able to uh, uh, get those scans off and be able to fight the army. So the strategy that Purple Wave is employing here is a professional style strategy called Two Base Arbiter, where you take your ex first expansion, you have two bases or gather resources, and then you tech directly to Arbiters, which, yeah, they, they cloak units, which is kind of handy, but the part that makes it really valuable is they can use the stasis ability on blocks of siege tanks, which helps you kind of get around the fact that siege tanks are incredibly efficient in large numbers and hard to fight otherwise. But they don't have to seem... Uh, so the Terran, their only mobile detector is the science vessel, and they don't seem to have one. So they're kind of dependent on these two comstats for all of their detection right now. Yeah, the Arbiter definitely limits the, the degree to the, which uh, Terran can, can fight the Protoss. It certainly makes it harder for the Terran to push it all the way across the map and take on the Protoss army. Earlier, you saw a few Dark Templar uh, in the fight. And part of the reason that you tend to employ Dark Templar prior to going Arbiters is because you want to force the Terran to use their scans on the Dark Templar uh, to survive and then later come in with the Arbiters and hopefully they have less energy for scans. And you seem to have a third base down here. Can you just talk about a little bit about the logic you use to take bases? Is it timing based? Is it 
um, based on opponent things? How do you do that? So each of, each of the strategies that Purple Wave uses kind of has, is, is designed at a high level around uh, cer certain goals and milestones. So in in this particular build, it's something like once you have your first Arbiter uh, complete or in training, or you otherwise feel safe for whatever reason, now you can take that third base because you're dedicating resources to expanding instead of building an army. So it's a question of survivability. And it, it, there it's just kind of uh, it's the same logic you, you apply as a human, same kind of rules of thumb. Uh, so that's that's an example where it's it's not really, it's it's really just if statements. It's fancy if statements. So you're getting away with murder here because they don't have a single unit that can attack air. Do you think maybe some Goliaths would have been <laughs> would have been a good choice here for dragon? Uh, it's it you can you can go you can go with the Goliaths. Ultimately, the the real threat is the ground army. And the the arbiters are just kind of a nuisance. Once Terran gets a science vessel out, uh, it's really just the the stasis ability of the arbiter that you really care about. You can get the Goliath, but then that's gas that could otherwise be going to more siege tanks, which are the unit you really want to be making lots of against Protoss. Cool. So down here, you're you're getting another sneaky expansion. You've kind of contained them. So there's with a lot of bots, what you see is maybe the decision making isn't at the same level of the humans. But one thing that happens is with this sort of combat simulation, you get for free this sort of contain where you push toward their base. I know this happened with you, Alberta bot. And what it would do is it would constantly send units at the enemy base. And even if it didn't end up attacking them at like the quote unquote correct human timing, the contain itself while you expand in the background is just such a huge economic advantage that you can just throw units at them for the rest of the game and end up winning. And that seems to be one of the things that's happened here. Yeah, it's something that's, that's uh, different in bot play versus human play is that because bots have infinite attention, they can leave their army out in the map, and as long as it doesn't get run down completely, they can back up as soon as they're, they they see danger and often take minimal losses. So they get the advantages, as you say, of having that kind of contain because of their infinite attention span or less at risk of the you know, army engaging on them when they're less ready to uh, fight and then having you know a couple seconds delay in backing that army up and taking additional damage. So you, said, you tend to see bots uh, be a bit more aggressive with their army positioning than humans often are because of that attention span effect. So they've got their science vessel out. Do you have any logic that sort of knows that science vessel is good against your strategy and you keep you seem to be keeping the uh, the arbiters away a little more? Is that is that built in there somewhere? Yeah, so the 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 arbiters position is mostly for covering the units with cloak and then when it wants to cast stasis will do that. There is some uh, logic to avoid having the arbiters on top of each other cuz one the real threat of the science vessel is not the detection which is Kind of handy to have, but the science vessel could use the EMP ability on the arbiters and deny them the ability to use stasis. So, so the, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the EMP ability targets the area. So if your arbiters are all clumped up together, then they're they're prone to all getting EMP, which you want to avoid. Yeah. So for those of you not so familiar with StarCraft, I know this is a bit hard to follow, but the EMP ability is sign of a shockwave that goes out. It's targeted on the ground. It's an AOE ability, and it removes is it all the shields and all the energy. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and so the energy in StarCraft is used to cast spells, and the stasis ability of the Arbiter can lock down units, and so that's really important. So we'll just speed it up here, because this has sort of been the inevitable here for a while. Um, you've you've promptly beaten Dragon here, but... Well, when I, Dragon <laughs> beat me more often than I beat Dragon by a good I know, so, so just for, the, for full disclosure, um, Dan chose these replays to send to me, so we'll... Uh, he may be winning in all of them. He may not be winning in all of them. But the results of these replays do not um, reflect necessarily the results of the competition. So let's go back here while I set up the next replay. That was a great game. And we were playing against Dragon, written by Vagard Mela, or TSEMU, as he is more usually known in the community. So I'm going to load up the uh, McCrave replay. So we've got one here we've got purple wave versus mccrave and of course now, there I'll, are sorry i'll say that one of my favorite things about the, the the aid starcraft tournament you run is that the source code of all the bots is available after the competition and when i was writing my own bot i read a lot of uh tsc blue source code to be was a very big inspiration to see how the bot was written how it accomplishes things and then incorporating a lot of the same ideas into my own bot and i think that's one of the reasons that the bots get stronger year over year is that they can build on what's been done before as inspiration yeah, that's a really good point, and I usually mention that during the uh, during the the presentation. But in case people don't know, 
Uh, this isn't true of every competition, but as Dan said, the aid competition, if you choose to participate in it, you have to open source your code. Because our goal as a competition isn't necessarily to have the strongest AI for StarCraft, it's to advance the start of the, the state of the art in AI for games in general. So yeah, um, being able to, as I said, how you Alberta bot was used by other things, being able to study your opponent's code um, and borrow things is, is just really great and is, and is really beneficial for the AI community as a whole. So I have the next replay loaded up here. Let's go into that. And this is Purple Wave as the Yellow Protoss versus McCrave as the Brown Zerg. And so yes, uh, McCrave, we did actually choose the right race for you. I just had the wrong race listed in the um, in the the results file. So this is McCrave. McCrave came fifth place in uh, in the competition against Purple Wave, uh, who was second place in the competition. And Dan, here we go. So. At the start of a game like this, what sort of map features or enemy race features do you take into account when deciding what your build order is going to be? Sure. So Purple Wave has a kind of graph of, of strategies that they could use. So some of those branches of, of the graph are based on uh, the enemy race. So they'll use different strategies against different races. Uh, some of those strategies are restricted to maps with certain features. So some strategies are really only appropriate if you have a map where you know where your opponent is at the start of a game. Uh, some strategies are stronger or weaker based on, for example, whether the area outside your base is uphill, downhill, or at the same level. Uh, but this game, what's going to mostly come to play is probably way of choosing strategies that uses against Zerg. Um, so you said one thing that's not uh, super obvious to people who don't play a lot of StarCraft, even me as someone who's who's watched a lot. Uh, the strategic differences between a, a ramp that goes down versus a ramp that goes up. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Because here we have a downward ramp, and in the last map, I think we had no ramp whatsoever. So how does that play into strategy selection a little bit? So when ranged units attack uh, up or downhill, when they, when they attack uphill, there's a very high chance that they'll miss their attacks, a, a, little, a little over 50%. Uh, so strategies that could get a contain on your opponent's base and deny their ranged units' ability to hit your units can be very strong. That comes to play a lot, especially in Protoss versus Protoss, uh, so less so in, in, in Protoss versus Zerg, but definitely does uh, factor into what strategies are likely to be successful. Another factor is vision. Uh, you cannot see uphill. If you want to see uphill, you either need a flying unit or you need to walk your unit uh, up to the front of a ramp. So then being able to deny your opponent's ability to see your units on a hill could also, for example, uh, empower short range units to defend more adequately against range units. One thing I see here, um, so I face this this issue as well. Um, so for a human, humans wouldn't be dancing their units back and forth like this, right? They would kind of leave them there or pull them back. And the reason that AIs can do this, of course, is because in our competition, we have like infinite APM. So as long as you're still making decisions, decisions you can be issuing like a thousand units per frame if you want to, or have 10,000 APM. Now, turns out that most bots aren't having APM that high. But what's happening here is, like you said before, I believe it's the combat simulation. You look a little bit forward, you see, okay, I don't think I can win this fight. And then when you go in, you maybe you take some damage and, and then you have to back up. So can you talk about one problem I ran into is like a timeout for that? Because you don't want to constantly be going in, taking some damage and moving back again. And I think a lot of bots face that problem. So how did you go about solving that problem? Sure. So when, uh, when, when Purple Waves is interpreting the results of a simulation uh, to decide whether or not to go in, there is some um, uh, recurrence in, in the way it interprets that. There's hysteresis that applies to the results. So, for example, uh, if, if, it does, if, it does, if it previously wanted to fight and it decides to not fight, uh, there's some hysteresis applied to that decision where it's going to prefer that decision for a period of time with the amount of force that decays. So that adds some consistency to the decisions, which, you know, uh, in theory, if your simulation is accurate, you shouldn't need that. Uh, but systematically, by being more consistent with whatever decisions you previously made, you tend to, over time, make better decisions. Uh-oh, you've got some mutas here in your base. How do you deal with this? <laughs> do you always uh, keep Dragoons home? or Because I know in you Alberta Bot, we just attack all the time. So how do you set yeah. up your defense forces? Uh, I'll, I'll get to that question in a second. What I want to highlight right here is that McGrave right now is demonstrating something that we have not really seen from Zerg Bots before. McGrave is... Uh, has really set the pace for Zerg bots in being able to do harassment with mutalisks and being able to find and exploit gaps in the defense and 
uh, get damage done with them, and then effectively trade with those Mutalisks. That's something that's been attempted all the way back since the first aid, first aid competition back in 2010 with the Overbind bot. Uh, but Grave is the first one that is so good with its Mutalisks that it can really emulate human strategies by posing human levels amount of threat. The really interesting thing is that, so in my opinion, I thought that the original Overmind bot did this the best up until McCrave. And it really hasn't been, like you said, it hasn't been replicated in over a decade, even though it ended up winning the first competition. Why do you think that is? Is it just a hard calculation or were people not willing to play the strategy or what? I think there have been some, some efforts which have been as good or better as Overmind since then, although it certainly has, has picked up pace in recent years. I think uh, one of the first bots we saw doing it uh, about on par with, with Overmind was Overkill uh, back in about 2015, 2016. And then we saw further development along those lines with uh, uh, Killerbot uh, in the past past couple of years with some really good mutilous harassment. Uh, but really, it's it's very it's very fought, hard to fine tune thing to get in, do damage, be willing to accept some damage that you receive from uh, on top of your mutilisks. Uh But like, if you if you're if you're not tuned well, it's going to go from being a really serious threat to just not being threatening and being a, a way of losing all your mutilisks. Uh, so I think the progress has been uh, pretty fast over the past couple of years, uh, but McGrave is really the first one to cross that line to being, you know, around human levels of damage. And you see the uh, you're coming out here. So is uh, are Corsairs a specific response to Mutalisks? Yeah. Uh, so Purple Wave will, will incorporate Corsairs by default in some of its strategies. We'll, we'll get some Corsairs for scouting and harassment. Uh, but in this particular case, it was not the strategy it wanted to employ. It saw the Mutalisks and thought, okay, I need some Corsairs, in particular, I need two Stargates worth of Corsair production. Cool. And as you were saying before about um, harassment like that, so harassment is is a really hard problem for AI to figure out on its own. And in my opinion, one of the reasons why it's so hard um, is it's probably the hardest problem in AI is knowing the long-term effects of current actions. So, for example, you have a game like StarCraft. The reason you have to hard code some stuff is because the effects of like the first units that you make aren't really seen until like 20 to 30 minutes later sometimes. And when you think about traditional algorithms like search or simulation or stuff like that, it's, you know, the deeper you go, the exponentially harder something gets. And so for something like harassment, it's kind of difficult to say whether or not this harassment is going to end up being worth it in the end, right? Because you might be trading, like an effective harass might actually trade more units of yours for the opponents but that may end up actually winning you the game and so it's just a difficult long-term decision problem for ai in general i think yeah absolutely a lot of uh, these decisions come down to not being able to to model the effects of what you your bot is going to do in the future and instead uh resorting as as a developer to doing things which tend to work uh and th that that's something that we see for example when you're talking about like units waffling back and forth that happens partly because the bot isn't uh, planning for where its its units are going to go, it's it's reacting. It's it's seeing the mm -hmm. scenario and reacting frame by frame, uh, and we see that with harassment too. As you say, you don't know what the trade off is necessarily going to be long term with you know losing some mulisks but also killing some workers. So you do things which tend to work in practice. And it seems to me here, um, your army is just crazy big. Um, so you've got 108 supply, and of course, if Zerg is ever down in supply, it's probably bad times for the Zerg. And I think that what's happened at the high level in this game, again, is that your your early game contain has stopped the Zerg from expanding, which on this map is probably hard to do for the Zerg because the third base is, is kind of far away. And uh, Zerg do need that creep in order to set up the third base. So, yeah, it seems like that, that economic contain that's a side effect of the early aggression is, is working out again in this in this scenario. And uh, I don't think we really need to <laughs> wait the 10 minutes that are left in this game. I think we can speed it up here a little bit. Yeah, so you're just cleaning up here, I believe. I think ultimately the, the strategies that have been employed on both sides are, are very reasonable, but the, a lot of the difference comes down to execution. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think we're, 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 that was really the, um, the trend among like the, the, the protest bots, especially at the top, where... They're employing a lot of the same strategies, but Stardust has much better execution in a lot of areas than, than the other bots. It has some of the best uh, army control and management. Uh, so something that came up a lot in the games between Stardust and Purple Wave is that Purple Wave would come out of the early game with a strategic advantage, 
uh, where on paper you would say, you know, Purple Wave should win this game, but Stardust was able to out execute. It was able to use fewer units more effectively and uh, eke out the win. No, that's great. And uh, it's cool to see. Uh, sorry, could you say again, like, how many different strategies your bot has? Uh, that's that, that that's a very large number, partly because it's it's a branching graph of strategies. But r- roughly in each matchup, there are going to be maybe like um, six different openers, and then you know s- six to a dozen different mid game transitions. It, it really varies a lot. I, I, the actual size of the graph is like twenty thousand permutations or something, but in practice, it's you know about about six major arcs per matchup. So uh, we're just getting into the last replay that we have here. Um, of course, there are. Uh, 11,000 replays available on the competition website and oh I forgot to let me actually go to the while you're explaining a little bit here um, can you explain just a little bit about how you chose that graph really it's it's my best uh, attempt at reproducing the strategies that, that professional players use because they have the best understanding of the game and because you know they're, they're the best solutions that have been invented so far for dealing with the constraints that Starcraft poses uh, so it's it's inspired by professional style of strategies and then adjusted by the capabilities of the bot. So the, the bots can't execute all the possible strategies uh, just because some of them require skills that they lack. Uh, that includes both the skills that my bot lacks as well as the strategies which the opponents don't do themselves because they lack the skills to execute them effectively. Uh, so the starting point is is professional play and then tuned from there. And uh, I'd like to get your opinion as well um, a lot of people don't like the fact that like some bots just have a bunch of strategies and then try them because they have infinite games, right? So for example, a human tournament might have um, might have like seven games, best of seven for the finals or best of five for the semifinals. So can you postulate on how your bot might change if someone said, for example, we're going to put you up against a human player in a best of seven? How might you change your strategy based on that? So as is right now, every distri- every diff- every different distribution of Purple Wave comes with uh, some amount of configuration, which uh, makes it better for that format. So in aid, it's tuned for the round robin format, where expects to play hundreds of games against an opponent and then be trying to win on win percentage. Uh, but for example, if you play on this StarCraft Human and AI ladder, which is where the bot is tailored for play against humans, it's going to select strategies pretty randomly the way you, that you might against um, a human opponent with some adaptation, but ultimately not trying to predictably do strategies which have historically worked against that player. Uh, yeah, so that, cool. that, that, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say again, so this uh, up here we have this game is Purple Wave versus Stardust. So Purple Wave is uh, luckily the purple color up here in the top left of the map. And this, I believe, is a four-player map? or No, it's a three-player map. Three-player uh, map? Yeah, so... Can you, is there anything in your bot, like I know, for example, in my bot did almost no map analysis. When you have a, like an asymmetrical map like this, what sort of strategy selection are you talking about? Is that, does that factor in at all? And by the way, before you answer that, um, so McCrave, or sorry, Stardust, we know from the, the questionnaire that Stardust goes for Mass Dragoons as well. So how do you respond to Mass Dragoons with Mass Dragoons? Uh, so th- there are a few adaptations that are made to the map. Uh, especially Protoss versus Protoss. So one of the adaptations is because this map is flat, Purple Wave is going to prefer getting a second gateway before this robotics facility that it wants to get, just because you need a little bit more muscle uh, to defend against attacks because you don't have the uphill helping you. Uh, Other adaptations include the scout timing. If you want to get information on your opponent by a certain time, you have to send out a scout sooner or later based on how far they're going to have to travel. And you Uh, seem to be getting a Reaver here for the first time. Yeah, yeah. So this is... uh, kind of a, a pro style uh, robotics facility opening where you're going to get Reaver, you're getting a shuttle that'll ferry it along because it's slow and uh, you know, you're in a rush because it's a, it's a real-time strategy game. Uh, but ultimately, the the reaction to the Dragoons is mostly just in the army composition, which doesn't come in so much in the in the mid-game because the Dragoon-Reaver composition is, is pretty set. But later on, you're going to want to consider, well, if they have more Zealots, then my army will benefit from having more Archons. Or if they're really heavy on Dragoons, then maybe the Archons aren't going to be so useful. Adaptations like that. And as as we talk about this, so all these things that we're saying are because we're kind of StarCraft players or we know the game or we've talked to professionals, right? Yeah. Um, but with when it comes to, say, for example, someone saying, oh, that's not AI, 
um, you know, you're just taking strategies and hard coding it. There's a lot of AI that has to go into even even if you know what strategy you want to do, if you haven't learned that strategy or if you haven't let the AI decide the strategy. Oh, this is a huge battle. Um, so you just you just decidedly won that battle with your Reaver in the back. Um, so what I was trying to say is that even if you know your strategy, there's a lot of AI going on under the hood to just execute that strategy. And so while a lot of these bots do have some um, rule-based things in their strategies, um, you know, that doesn't mean that some of the systems that they use to carry out those things don't contain AI. And so, yeah. no, not everything is, is machine learned from scratch like a, a billion dollar company like DeepMind can do. But uh, there's still a lot of AI going on under the hood for sure. Oh, you just yeah. got scammed on that on that Reaver Scarab that got stuck. Uh, it's, it's it's the way the way of uh, Reaver life. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I I, th I think a lot of that comes out in the details of the execution. Uh, so I'll talk about Stardust for a second because because Stardust really has some some really amazing control of its units. Uh, as, as Bruce mentioned in his uh, in his survey, uh, Stardust uses Boyd's um, blocking for its units. So one of the things you'll see with Stardust armies compared to mine is that they tend to be much more coherent. They they're they're more uh, they're more together. They're, the units tend to get a little less splayed out, so that when they pick fights, they tend to be more likely to get off a big volley of shots at their opponent before their opponents are really lined up to fight. So th you'll see that even though uh, Purple Wave has won some fights and has a uh, more effective unit composition in having Reavers against Dragoons, Stardust is, is trading very evenly, in fact, maybe even mm -hmm. a little better. And that's partly because its units are, are more coherent using with the uh, flocking techniques it's using. Yeah, so for people who aren't aware of what's happening here, maybe they're they're interested in AI, but they don't know the units. So Dan's purple units here, these are called shuttles, and they can actually walk over and pick up some of his units. So one of those units is called a Reaver. And a Reaver has a very long... It's almost like a tank in a way. It has a very long-range attack. Um, and so it's very powerful, but it's very slow and it's very fragile. And so these shuttle strategies are that the shuttle will come over and pick up the Reaver in order to simultaneously move it faster and protect it from possible destruction. So that's what, what Dan is carrying out here, and it's very effective. Oh, you've just dropped one over over on the wrong side over here. It's kind of funny. But those those yes. little bugs always happen. Yeah, what well, the difference you'll see here between human and AI play is that because the, the AI is not really restricted in terms of what it could do mechanically, because it could play at kind of infinite speed, you could do things like juggle multiple reavers with multiple shuttles, which humans really just won't attend very often. Even the best players in the world won't try more than two shuttles at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, so the bot could do things faster, but it's, it's making weaker decisions. You know, I think any any strong player would look at this game and be ripping their hair out at, at the, some of the decisions that the bot is making. But overall, it's making like relatively competent decisions executed very fast. And and over time, like for example, when Alpha Star was playing, it was obviously a really powerful system. But if you had asked me to bet a million dollars on what Alpha Star was going to learn to do, it would be mass stalkers with Blink because that's the most OP possible strategy if you have computer level precision, right? And so while Alpha Star did pretty well, I think it did it well in the most friendly scenario possible for for um, for AI, which is making a whole bunch of a single type of unit and learning to use its mo most OP ability. And so over time, what we see in aid is that while in this particular match, there's a lot of Dragoons, you know, even just using Reavers a few years ago was something pretty difficult to, to make decisions on. And the way you're sort of bulldogging here while picking up the Reavers is is just way more advanced than we've seen in past years, I think. And of course, we've we've chosen a replay here for Dan, where, where Dan is, is doing quite well, but of course Stardust was the overall winner. And uh, if we look at the results, I'm just going to peek over here. So Stardust did beat Purple Wave 125 out of 150 times, but we've we've just chosen one of the replays where that didn't necessarily happen. <laughs> The, the the advantages of being in the the right time zone at the right time helps a lot. Yeah, uh, and, yeah uh, Stardust absolutely got the better of my bot. And one of the things that Bruce really demonstrated was the the although his strategies were not, I think I think a lot of humans would call them not ideal. They were better executed, way way better executed. Uh, if you want to look to like what are techniques that are just very effective, uh, Bruce's bots tend to demonstrate those with extreme economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, I think we're just in the cleanup phase of this game, so I'm going to stop this one as well. Um, but one thing I also did want to show, if I can go back here to the to our mission screen, 
is that I have now uploaded uh, or I've I've made public all of the results. So if you go to, um, I've posted it in the chat there. So StarCraft AI competition website slash 2020. All of the results are there. And let me just pull this over into, uh, let me see if this works properly. There we go. Okay. So let me make this just a little bit bigger. So I had this resized for the, um, for the replays, but this will work too. So here we can see uh, this is the, the website for the results. And oh, by the way, thanks, thanks Dan for all the amazing commentary and for joining me on the stream. Uh, we've already been going for like an hour and a half. And so this is going to be a really long video, which is awesome for people who want this information. But what I'm going to do here now is just uh, go over the, uh, the results page so that so I can show people where they can get all the results. And thank you so much, Dan, for giving me those replays and for commenting with me on stream. That was really fun. Thanks for having me. All right. So thanks again, Dan. I just I just booted him out of the call, but that's okay. Um, the last thing I want to do is just show you the website. So here are all of the results um, for the competition. And we can see here, I think I can actually maximize this a little bit. There we go. That's a little bit nicer. And I can remove this aid logo because I had that initially there to uh, not spoil any of our results. So these are the re this is the results page. It's quite um, it's quite bare bones, but here you can see things like the registration uh, information. You can get the bot win percentage over time graph, which is right here. So in here you can like delete uh, bots. All this is like real time JavaScript. You can look at this. You can see uh, the win percentage uh, or sorry the wins per round graph. You can uh, download all of the bot source code. So here there's a folder uh, where you have all the uh, submissions from all the bots. These are byte for byte what I was submitted by the players, or you can download all the bots if you want to. Also, we have uh, the replay folders. So if you go back, um, if you go back to the top level in the, you can get the replay folders. That's just slash replays. You can also see the bot final IO folders. So this lets you uh, see all the different learning that was done in the competition. You have the crash logs. I'm sure McCrave is going to be uh, uh, bedtime reading those crash logs or sorry, the timeout logs. Um, he didn't crash. Um, and the detailed game results. So you can go in here to the HTML table of the detailed results. That actually takes a second to load. So here every game, um, you can actually see this and you get a link to the replay. The links to the replays aren't currently um, uh, working. I have to set that up. That involves unzipping 12,000 files on a very slow server. So bear with me, but you can download all the replays if you want. Here you can do things like, for example, uh, let's say I was you Alberta bot, or let's say I was McCrave. I'm sorry to pick on McCrave. Um, no, let's say it was you Alberta bot. Oh geez, what happened here? Okay. Uh, so bots, you Alberta bot, I can select that and I can say only crashes, right? So I can see all the games that had crashes when you Alberta bot was part of it. And so that's a really good, uh, system for, um, being able to debug your bot, etc. So all of these, all of these things are here. And then if I go back, uh, you can also, if you want to do uh, results parsing yourself, you can get all these files in, in plain text. So you can parse those if you want. We also have uh, the results table here. So this is the, the overall results table and we went uh, into detail about that in the presentation itself. We also have, this is the uh, bot to bot pairing matchup. So here we can see, for example, even though we did see uh, Purple Wave beat Stardust in that particular game, uh, Stardust ended up beating Purple Wave 120 out of the 150 matches that it played. And here you can see that the highest winning percentage against Stardust was actually Banana Brain. So thank you to Banana Brain for bringing Stardust down a little bit of a notch. Uh, but Banana Brain was actually able to beat um, Stardust about a third of the time, which is pretty cool. And here we just see that Dragon beat Purple Wave most of the time and Banana Brain most of the time, but then lost to Steam Hammer and ZZZK Bot. And finally, down on the bottom here, if you want to debug your um, your results on different maps, you can come down here and you can say, oh, look, so for example, if I was Microwave and I was winning a bunch of times on these maps, maybe I want to go see, um, well, why did I do so badly on, 
on, on Polaris, right? Or why did uh, ZZZK bot do so well on Python, for example? So lots of cool stats that you can get from this. And you can go to StarcraftAIcompetition.com and click on results and get all of those files. And that's all I have for tonight, actually. So remember that aid starts tomorrow. And so if you're part of aid, I will see you there. Hopefully we can we can chat over voice and and uh, talk about the competition. And I will be giving a shortened version of this talk at the at the strategy game um, workshop and the full version of the presentation again at the main aid conference. So thank you all so much and see you at aid. <laughs>